Uh, my name's Fiona Crawford. I'm clearly not Shelley Ware, but I'm going to try to fill her very talented shoes. She's just been unable to attend at late notice, but I'm just going to introduce everybody so they're not standing awkwardly, and then, I'd, um, and then I will actually complete an acknowledgement of commentary after that. But uh, first of all, I have Shireen Ahmed, who's standing at the back. <laughs> um, Shireen is a multi-platform senior cr contributor with CBC Sports, a TEDx speaker, a mentor, and an award-winning sports journalist and activist who focuses on the intersections of racism and misogyny in sports. She is a global expert on Muslim women in sport. She's also the co-creator and co-host of the Burn It All Down feminist sports podcast, which is currently on her hiatus, but I was just saying in the back, uh, back in the green room that I live in hope that it's coming back because I'm a big fan. Uh, she also teaches sports journalism and sports media at the Toronto Metropolitan University. So please welcome Shireen. Um, I might follow the order that's on the screen. So next we have Emma Checker. And Victorian uh, football fans will need no introduction for Emma, but uh, Emma is a professional footballer who has represented Australia at youth and senior levels. She achieved her Matilda's debut at 16, uh, which was in 2012, and Emma will tell you that I actually got to work with her at that time because I was running the social media for the Matildas, so I think we did Emma's first interview together. Um, Emma has spent the last 12 years playing National League domestically and internationally, including contracts in South Korea, France, Iceland and Sweden. She has been a key pillar in a number of premiership and championship winning teams with uh, Melbourne Victory, Canberra United and Melbourne City. She uh, made history by becoming the youngest captain of an A-League team during her second stint at Adelaide United. And most recently, she spent three, uh, three years captaining Melbourne City. Away from football, uh, she's, there's more, sorry. <laughs> uh, away from football, Emma's uh, completed a bachelor degree in business, majoring in public relations, and she is a qualified personal trainer. She's currently working at the Professional Footballers Australia, or the PFA, and she actually ran an awesome event, uh, event just the other week because she is the events and administration coordinator. So please welcome Emma. <laughs> Uh, next we have Julie Dolan. She actually just referred to herself as a whack-a-mole out the back <laughs> uh, because she's popping up in so many places with the Women's World Cup. Uh, I think she's moved through the world a little bit anonymously prior to this, but uh, all of a sudden everybody wants to talk to Julie and it's a really fantastic thing. So uh, those of you who know her know she is the Head of Community and Marketing for the Central Coast Sports College in New South Wales. She's an ambassador for the 2023 Women's World Cup and of course she is the inaugural Matildas captain. So she played 34 matches across a 14 year career, including appearing in the 1988 Pilot Women's World Cup. She has a medal named after her. It's awarded to the best female footballer in Australia each year. And she also has an awards ceremony co-named after her, the Dolan Warren Awards, uh, which is named after her and fellow football great Johnny Warren. Uh, Julie was inducted into the Football Australia Hall of Fame in 1999, and in 2018 she was named a member of the Order of Australia. So please welcome Julie. Thank you. <laughs> Last but not least, we have Azmina Hussain. So I was actually on your brother's show the other day, and he was talking you up, and I think you have a very talented family. <laughs> well, yes, he had good reason to. So uh, for those of you who know Azmina, she is a principal uh, at Morris Blackburn Lawyers. She's the chairperson of the Islamic Museum of Australia. She is a non-executive director at Football Victoria, so has a really strong football connection, and the Victorian Institute of Sport. Uh, she's also a 2023 Women's World Cup ambassador, so like Julie, she's flying all over the country for, for lots of football games at the moment. Uh, Asmina is a member of the SBS Advisory Committee. She has extensive experience in workplace law and is a member of the Victoria Statutory Work Cover Advisory Committee. She is listed in the prestigious Doyle's Guide as a preeminent Australian personal injuries lawyer and as a Law Institute of Victoria accredited specialist. Accredited specialist, sorry. Asmina is an outgoing director and trustee of the Victorian Women's Trust, so has a strong gender equality uh, background. She's the deputy chair at In Touch Multicultural Centre Against Family Violence, advisor to Victoria Police, Chief Commissioner's Human Rights Strategic Committee, 
She's an AFL multicultural advisor, but we'll, we won't hold that against her today. Uh, and she's the vice president of the Office for Women at the ICV. Most recently, uh, like Julie, she was awarded an Order of Australia medal for her contribution to the community and the law. Please join me in welcoming. Thank you. Now that we've introduced everybody, I do want to just acknowledge I've flown in from Mianjin, the land of the Turbul and Yagara peoples. Uh, and as we start our session today, I would like to pay my respects to the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation uh, as the traditional owners of the lands or the unceded lands on which we're meeting today. I pay my respects to their elders past and present, and I extend that to all the Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people who are in the room as well with us today. So as I was saying, I'm not Shelley Ware, I'm Fiona Crawford, I'm a writer and editor and a researcher. Uh, I've followed and written about women's football for a number of years, including uh, a couple of books, uh, the most recent one being The Matilda Effect. Uh, really, we're here though to hear about these people today, so I'm going to do my best to stay out of the way because I really want to hear their fantastic contributions as well. I've had to adjust my questions ever so slightly because uh, the Australia-Nigeria game, I think, has thrown a little bit of a spanner in the works <laughs> for, for a few of us. But I will start by saying, what a week and a bit. Um, this is already proving to be the most successful Women's World Cup to date, and we're only, I don't even know, six, ten days in. We all know the impressive stats, but I'm going to rattle off just a couple of them. More than 1.5 million tickets sold, approximately 460,000 people turning up to games, uh, Matilda's jerseys outselling the Socceroos jerseys during their World Cup and since their World Cup in 2022, broadcast figures that just keep tumbling. I think it was 1.24 million for the opening game. We're at more than 3 million for the Nigeria game. New Zealand, because we can't forget about our co-hosts, They've achieved their first ever Women's World Cup win. And we've got minnow teams like uh, Vietnam, Haiti, Nigeria, who have been absolutely playing out of their skin. Uh, I don't think we could have asked for a better couple of weeks, except for Australia to be progressing through with a little bit more smoothly. <laughs> um, I have to say, though, you know, even though we've been on the right time zone, I don't think a lot of us have had a sleep, much sleep. So I do want to just gauge before we kick off this panel on a scale of one to 10, <laughs> how exhausted is everybody, but how pumped are you? Well, I think if I can start off, um, I can't believe that uh, I'm more exhausted than these people. They sound a lot busier than I am, but um, <laughs> I am, I'm exhausted. Uh, but I wouldn't have it any other way. Uh, for 40 years prior, uh, nobody's been asking any questions. So to finally be able to tell stories and to celebrate what an enormous event this is, uh, you know, I wouldn't have it any other way. I can sleep sometime after the cup. <laughs> um, for me, I am pretending to do my day job. Um, <laughs> just trying to intertwine the two, football and you know, human rights, equality, <laughs> workplace lawyer. It's working well so far. <laughs> the work is working well. <laughs> yeah, for me, much the same. I think I've found myself watching more games than looking at my computer that has the work on it coming in. Um, but I think it's, a, it's such an occasion that we will only get to live through in this way once and... I think, you know, none of us would forgive ourselves if we didn't truly embrace this opportunity for what it is. Well, I'm very fortunate. My day job is to actually cover the tournament. So, <laughs> I, you know, I feel a bit of survivor's guilt here, actually. <laughs> um, I'm sleeping uh, maybe four or five hours. I've been here, I think, 10 days. And in Canada, that's nine days. I, But I'm also really, this is my fourth World Cup that I've attended in my life, the third women's. And... It's so lovely to be in a place where the country is excited as well. When I was in France in 2019, nobody in Paris mm -hmm. knew or cared. And that bothered me tremendously to hear that the, you know, Matilda's, the Tilly's jerseys are selling out. Um, transparency, I'm Canadian. I'm obviously mm -hmm. hoping that Canada goes through. <laughs> I realize, oh, and brilliant yeah. hats off to the Wheeler Center for setting up a panel such as this days before <laughs> the do or die match. But it's an honor to be here and one that I don't take lightly. <laughs> Look, I, I really want to ask, because you have all been here since the beginning, and for, in Julie's case, literally since the beginning, what have these last couple of weeks been for you? I mean, Julie, you touched on it. 
nobody paid much attention and suddenly we are the most popular people in town. <laughs> yeah, nobody did pay much attention and all these stories that are coming out, they're just delivering uh, what a rich colourful history the Matildas do have. Uh, but nobody ever knew that. So what's inspiring for me is that now people know that. And I think that's what's uh, increasing the popularity even more. Um, or I might be a bit biased about that. But um, yeah, I'm just uh, yeah, loving everything that's being asked and really willing to give information about what has gone before. And there's been a lot. Do you need me to touch on what? If, if I start touching on what has gone before, we'll get to <laughs> three o'clock before, <laughs> before I, I'm even a quarter of the way through. No, that's it. Well, but can there I ask, has been a lot. Can I ask just one follow-up question? Because you mentioned it in the green room, which I thought was fascinating. You said, and I noticed this when I was writing the books as well, is the former Matildas were genuinely surprised that we were interested in their stories. And you're saying that you're starting to hear stories that have never been told before or that players didn't know were important. And I think that's actually, yeah, I'm fascinated by that. Mm. Yeah, and that, that's so true. Even the stories that I hadn't heard before. And uh, I was talking about one particular story uh, about a coach, uh, you know, having to put 12 of the players in the back of his panel van uh, to get them to training because f for whatever reason they couldn't get to training. So it was all about kids getting to training. But if you think about that these days, it's not going to fly. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, but it's about successive generations of Matildas doing whatever it took to get, you know, players on the park to advance the game. So, and that's, you know, that includes all our support staff who were unpaid and usually, or received little recompense. Um, so they were working so terribly hard in the background just to make sure we got on the park and to see what women's football develop and hasn't it. <laughs> How many lamingtons did you sell? Well, <laughs> I was just, you know, funny you ask about lamingtons. I think I'm going to be, be known as the lamington queen soon because I keep talking about them. But the comparison I give is, you know, we're, we're now talking about 1.5 million tickets having been sold to watch a women's football game. Mm -hmm. And back in my day, we were thinking, oh, don't, don't know if I could make 1.5 million lamingtons <laughs> <laughs> to sell so I can get the money to travel mm -hmm. to a women's football tournament. Mm -hmm. So that's the comparison. Or if we compare the initial crowds at the first international match in 1979, the, um, you know, I, I remember walking the streets with flyers and pamphlets and putting them in letterboxes in the local area so that people knew there was an international game going on. And we did get a write-up in the local paper uh, mm -hmm. uh, the day before, but that was predominantly about the male referee. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and as far as referees go, I think he was all right. You know, so there's no <laughs> criticism there. It was just, you know... Uh, but the, the spectators numbered 200. Mm. And then we look at the first game of the Matildas, 75,000. Mm -hmm. So for me, you know, it's, it's surreal, it's overwhelming, it's... Uh, I think it's an emotional roller coaster. You know, we keep going up and down, and then the Matildas throw in, you know, a loss against Nigeria. Goodness me! <laughs> so, yeah, it's all been on. Um, and just just to add to that, as much as that's important here, it sets a precedent globally for what can be done, and not to sort of say, I mean, football, the culture of women's football, for those of us that have been around to watch it, it hasn't changed that much. It's just that everyone else is starting to pay attention yeah. now. Mm -hmm. And it's like they're discovering something that has already been, the foundations were laid, but there's still struggles. There's no discussion about a ban of hijab in France for footballers. There's no discussion about, well, there was on the Brazilian plane, women not having access to go watch football in Iran. Mm -hmm. And these are two issues that I worked on personally. But it's also drawing attention to the lack of, you know, fair pay. Canadian Federation, Nigeria hasn't been paid in a while. Uh, Jamaica's had to crowdfund based on a player's mother set up a GoFundMe. So we're looking at issues that while, you know, someone like Ada Hederberg steps away from international play for five years, there's still federations that are not anywhere near that. Yeah. And while we celebrate, and we should celebrate the joys, these milestones are hugely important. Um, we also should give a moment to reflect and see how we can offer further solidarity for other people who aren't having their voices amplified. 
Mm. I want to come back to that um, if I can in a moment. I just wanted to ask Emma and Asmina how you found the first couple of weeks, but then if we can revisit that, that would be great. Yeah, I think um, for me it's it it's honestly surprised me because I felt like I was prepared and being in camp the last few years building up to this, everything was a countdown and every day in camp the first thing we would look at before training was how many days until mm. the first game. So it felt like I was ready for how big this was going to be, mm. but I, I don't think it truly hit me until we were at the stadium for the first match just what this does mean and... Even now I still have moments where I, I actually just have to pause and sit back to reflect upon how far we've come because um, I debuted in 2012 and even though that, that wasn't that long ago, the change since then is huge mm -hmm. and it's not to discredit everything before that, like Julie touched on, but I still came in at a time where there was no match payments. Um, the non-contracted players didn't get paid. No one knew who the Matildas were. So I think when I look back at that and how quickly it's changed and the fact that we are now hosting the biggest World Cup ever, um, mm. it is it is overwhelming because it's hard to actually process how we've come so far. Yeah. Did you have to sell lamingtons? <laughs> <laughs> no. I, share your recipe. You, you yeah. did the lamington work for us. No. <laughs> Freddie Frogs. No, that's a secret yeah. recipe. <laughs> I'll get it off you later. Um, well, for me, um, we've got... Two players, and, and of course Shireen works in football. I don't. Um, and so as someone that's coming from that spectator or external perspective, um, I've been blown away. Um, so as a legacy ambassador, my role's around um, ensuring that we harness the momentum that we have right now for, for the game and, and making sure that um, what lives on beyond the World Cup lives on uh, as a legacy that uh, continues for generations to come. Um, for me, it, um, I think un I really underestimated the, the scale um, mm. of how huge um, the Matildas brand is and uh, the scale of just women's football. Uh, I, the, the significant momentum um, certainly that continues to grow um, and I've, I've just been blown away. I, I share the, the sentiment about the countdown. Um, as an ambassador, we were appointed nearly two years ago. I was pregnant with my first... Um, so I was the pregnant ambassador. Now I'm pregnant again, so it's just <laughs> never ending. Um, she and, has been busy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> need to start making lamingtons. Um, and, um, yeah, it's just been an incredible journey. So um, I've met some incredible people along the way. Um, I love hearing Julie's stories about um, the times that have been and, and the difficulties that we've navigated. Um, I think it's so important that we never forget that part too. It's so important. And I think uh, what's, what's really important now is uh, to expand on that. We do have teams in place to harness this momentum. Um, teams at Football Australia are focused on exactly that. And they're critically aware of how important this tournament is mm. uh, in terms of um, progressing the game even further forward. But to make sure that when the big roadshow leaves town, we just don't forget about everything and that we continue the work after that. And that's where the hard work begins, really. So um, when we used to come back from tournaments, uh, every, as I said, most people were volunteers, so everyone went back to their paid employment. There was no hope of continuing the drive to get the women's game going forward. So we're in a much better place now. So um, that's a great thing. Can I ask then, because I feel like I need to address the elephant in the room, uh, you know, we're, we're co-hosting our home World Cup and with that comes a certain expectation that there's going to be a fairy tale finish for us. Uh, it's looking a little bit shaky at the moment. Um, I did hear Sam Kerr's calf referred to as the calf that stopped a nation the other day. <laughs> uh, who'd have thought that, you know, the nation would be obsessed with a woman a footballer's calf, but here we are. Um, and as we know, the Matildas <laughs> are struggling to make it out of the group. I'm curious how dependent, um, because... Like, we really need this to kick women's football onto another level, both in, within Australia but also globally. How dependent is Australia doing well or New Zealand doing well on the success of, of football in Australia and beyond? Emma's um, question, yep. Yeah, I, I think obviously a lot of responsibility is on Australia and New Zealand, but I think it is mostly bigger than that. I think it's on... It's everyone's responsibility, yes... 
we're the host nations, but and ideally both the host nations are successful. But I, I do think it's the responsibility of all of us collectively because it's this we are the world game and every nation in this tournament is obviously fighting their own battles. And so you have your own independent battles, but I think it does go bigger to being we are united in working towards an end goal collectively. So I think regardless of who it is in the finals and who it is that makes it through, it, it's on everyone to, to do their part. So, yes, the, the best case is that we see Australia, I'm really sorry, make it through. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I do think that it, it's, yeah. we have to look up into a broader lens than just that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that was really, that resonated in 2019 was the final of the entire crowd chant chanting equal pay. And, you know, we saw the United States women's national team just sort of rally up their nation and the world. And, 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 and I think there's something to that if it needs to happen here. Um, if it needs to happen in, in, in places like this that also draw attention to other federations. And quite frankly, from where I posit, the AFC is largely ignored in the global discussion. And I think this is really going to help amplify that and the teams from out here. And that's extremely important because the struggles struggles against patriarchy and struggles against the control of those at the top who make the decisions that affect um, women and non-binary players, they happen from men who make these decisions. So the fact that it's happening here or it happens in Canada or Jamaica or anywhere else, we're very united. It's a global struggle. So uni uniting that um, is, is really important and to see it being amplified here in a way that other global media have no choice but to discuss it mm -hmm. is really important and I think it'll hopefully, that's what I hope to see out of this as well as an advance out of the group stage obviously. I'm <laughs> not, I mean, if there was a way for all of us to go together I would really love that too but it's called the group of death for a reason. Um, but yes, and then, then there's the excitement of the football. I do want to say that. Mm -hmm. I have never been so riveted. The Philippines winning their first, mm -hmm. you know, match was... I, I still get tingles when I think about it. Um, Ali crying with Jacinda in the back. Like, everybody cried about that. Um, I just... It's so important. And yes, Sam Kerr's... I still... I'm texting everyone about Sam Kerr's calf. <laughs> like, I really would like... Jesse Fleming was the same thing. Is she starting? Is she... What's happening? Mm -hmm. So, like, the buzz about that, because... It reminds me of the conversations, the minutia that people pay attention to in men's sports. Yes. Mm. And I'm not trying to copy, because mm. the one thing about women's game that I find really beautiful, and Julie, you could yay or nay this, is that it didn't copy the men's game. It created its own culture. Mm. And that's why it's so precious and needs to be protected. Mm. Yeah, and it's a very different culture. Uh, a little bit similar to the tennis with the women's game and the men's game. They're completely different games for whatever reason. Uh, and audiences and fans gravitate to one or the other, sometimes both. Uh, but basically, yeah, we're looking at a completely different game. Mm. You touched on it um, about saying wanting every team to go through, and I think we are really... There is, uh, as much as we need Australia to go through, Nigeria, as you've touched on, uh, is having some pay issues and some um, they're having to speak out against the Federation. Jamaica's had to fundraise to get here. They had a GoFundMe... Haiti really um, scarce resources as well and they're playing out of their skin. I mean, the list goes on and on. There's probably some other teams I really should be mentioning in there. But um, I'm curious because Sam Mewis, who's a US women's national team player who is not here through a knee injury, but she said during the week um, that teams coming into this tournament are almost in a catch-22 situation. If the teams that lack funding and investment perform well, so your Nigerias and your Haitis, um, if they do well, the Federation say, see, doing fine, no further investment required. Uh, but if those same teams lose, the Federation say, should we, why should we invest in this? They're no good. Mm. Um, it's clearly not going to have a return on investment. I'd probably also add to that the Matildas are probably, I mean, you wait for the media to turn. Once they're out, they're going to say, we gave you a home base, we gave you bean bags, we gave you a barista, <laughs> and you didn't, re you didn't return your investment. So I'm curious about that sort of funding tension and that constant need to prove yourselves, which I think is a new pressure for the Matildas, but, yeah, has probably existed all along for the other teams. I'm opening that to anybody who feels <laughs> strongly. 
I get so mad about this. I'm just going to say yeah, it. Yeah, go for it, Shereen. Yeah. I'm, so, so, I'm just like, oh, it's burn, you know, burn it all down. There was a name the podcast was called Burn It All Down. And mm. the thing is that these are not expectations that happen from the men's side. It's like mm. exactly the catch-22, oh, but it's pressure put on. The other thing is investment in women's sport. Results don't happen overnight. The NBA, yeah. one of the largest leagues, was in debt for 20 years before they started to make money. Invest, we know the product for women's sport is unbelievable. We know it, we see it with the numbers, and there's still those randos on Twitter that are like, nobody watches women's sports. You're like, okay, mate, sure. <laughs> We're not even gonna respond at this point. But it's frustrating because there's a reluctance to do so, and it gets back, and this is a sociologist in me speaking, it gets back to not valuing women's labor. It gets back to not valuing the work that women do, make no mistake about it, it's work, and they need the social supports. I did a story on ACL tears, and one of the things I spoke to with a, a specialist was psychosocial factors are imperative, meaning resources, nutrition, mm. transportation, not 12 in the back of a van anymore. Mm. That's not, I mean, Julie, you're a superhero to be able to have gone through that and live to tell those tales, but that's not where we know we need to be. No, and, and it's definitely not where we are. Mm. Uh, but as we were talking about before, I think the, the Hades, the Jamaicas, the, the Nigerias are at that place that we were way back yeah. then. So there is hope. Um, and, and that's also important that they realise what we're talking about here is that people get behind them and help to drive that. And hopefully uh, we don't have that tension, OK, they're not doing well, so we don't fund them, or they're doing OK, so mm -hmm. they don't need any more. So we, we went all through that. Asmina, that might be even a chance to ask you. I mean, in Victoria, we know the legislation has changed. I'm based in Queensland. We don't have the same sort of gender equality um, legislation coming in yet. But I'm curious about how that's about to ramp up and what sort of changes we're starting to see or what's going to be in the pipeline that might improve yeah. some of these issues. Yeah, and even, even just more broadly around the issue of uh, pay inequity. Mm. Um, you know, the prize money being one quarter of what, what the men's... Uh, game is. I mean, it, 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 this, whilst the argument doesn't even exist in tennis, it, it's slightly different in that it's a shorter game, so maybe there's some sort of... But there's absolutely no disparity between the men's, men's and women's game, uh, which frustrates me. So we've got a long way to go in that regard, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, but, yep, certainly in Victoria there's um, good um, advancements being made in terms of uh, ensuring that women are represented um, in leadership level uh, when it comes to sport. So uh, it's in order to get funding here in Victoria, essentially, you must have 40% representation of women on your boards. Question that 10% that's missing, but 40% um, <laughs> no. is a good start. Um, and, um, uh, I mean, it's, it's been taken up quite seriously across, uh, across the sector. So um, for boards to be funded, they um, need that 40% representation. I hope in the future it, it, it won't be needed, um, It'll just be business as usual mm. to have women represented mm. on boards. And, you know, we're, we're seeing that certainly with um, at Football Australia and the work mm. that myself and the other ambassadors are doing around infiltrating representation of women within football, whether it's in sports administration, on the pitch, players, referees, the, the, whole, the whole lot. Um, uh, we're, we're certainly seeing the benefits. And, I mean, football in Australia is the um, largest represented game by women. Uh, and continues to grow, so it just makes good business sense. Yeah, but I think uh, if we peel it back a bit further, despite the popularity of the Matildas, uh, the issues that prevent women and, and girls from fully participating mm. in sport are, are very basic still, um, and, but that's what Football Australia, the Legacy 23 initiative, is aimed at addressing. So, um, But if I can give you an example of just, you know, one of the gender role expectations and, and the, uh, how that limits participation for women and girls. When I started playing, um, I needed to make my own way to training. And I was 14 years old, and uh, while mum took me a few times, um, I had four brothers and one sister, so she couldn't leave them at home alone with dad at work. So we've got the, the female carer, and the male breadwinner. And that, that's just how, how things were. It was normal. So, but that didn't allow me to get to training 
unless I took public transport. Um, so I would do that. Um, and then what? I would go to my teammates' place, and they would give me a lift to training. And after training, they'd drive 50 kilometres out of their way to drop me home because I couldn't get on public transport at night. It was just not safe. So those are the sort of workarounds, and, that ha and that's how simply it plays out, you know, because of uh, role expectations in society. And, um, you know, and that brings up another uh, limitation for women and girls participating in sport, and that's uh, uh, personal safety. I'm often asked about uh, public conveniences and, and inadequate lighting. And I can remember, you know, playing it in uh, parks and they were very dimly lit. And um, basically, sometimes, well, most of the time we used that to our advantage because the, the coach would say, OK, girls, five times around the oval to warm up. <laughs> <laughs> and so when me and a couple of others got to the dark bits, we'd drop down in the long grass <laughs> and we'd wait for the team to come back round and join them. Jesus, that was tough. And, uh, so, and, and things like that. And people ask me about, you know, the public for conveniences, uh, dimly lit, you know, right down the end of the oval, if there were any at all. And, um, yes, it, it was something that we thought about, but I was talking to Molly at the airport the other day, who's here today, and I was saying, but I came from an era where we had outside dunnies. So we were so used to traipsing down the backyard in the dark just to go to the loo that it didn't present that many fears for us. So uh, we're looking at, you know, growing up in an era where these things were quite normal, but um, they were actually limits to participation. I, I wanted to ask, actually, because it feels like women's football is having, has to do a lot of jobs and the World Cup is having to do a lot of jobs. There's the gender equality job, mm. there's the human yeah. rights job. I mean, when Brazil turned up uh, with their plane emblazoned with activists... Um, Detail, like pictures and their quotes on there. I thought, right, we're on our way. There's going to be this is going to be a really um, meaty World Cup in terms of human rights um, activism. And then everything's kind of gone a little bit quiet. We've got some armbands that maybe FIFA has corporatized, you know, um, social issues. Maybe that's sort of muted everything. But I'm curious because it, it's not just a sporting tournament. It has to do a lot of jobs. And so you're talking about barriers to inclusion. I'm wondering about some of the others that sort of spring to mind for each of you. Maybe starting with Shireen? I'm just looking, making eye contact with me. Yeah, but, well, yeah. I mean, for a lot of them, and, you know, Julie already noted them, Jamaica, Haiti, Nigeria have pay issues, but it's also Canada. I don't want this to be, the narrative to be the global south. It very much happens. It happened in the United States. I mean, the discourse about equal pay happens everywhere. But along that, those lines, I mean, there's are there are issues that we would, we would like to see more of. I mean, you know, there's... I know that there's been some discourse, and I'm not familiar enough with it to talk about it very specifically, but there was some criticism from Indigenous communities here. Um, and my language, my vernacular will be a little different because in Canada, the Indigenous population are not referred to as Aboriginals. So forgive me if my language is a little bit out of sync. First Nations as well. It's, it's First yep. Nations as well. So, um, and for example, in mega events, they, there's been criticism of using musketry or uh, indigenous representation, First Nations, for the convenience of the rest of the world to look as if population, uh, you know, the, the history is sort of being sport washed. Mm -hmm. And that could be happening here. And there's mm -hmm. a long history. I was lucky to visit the Immigration Museum not far from here, mm -hmm. I believe. And to look, because Canada and Australia are very similar in those histories of, you know, of settling and, you know, like literal cultural genocide of populations. Mm. And for me to go, I was very humbling because it's very similar, but it's something that's actually not taught. And there is a way, like I said, without diminishing the importance of advancement of women's sport. But really, if you're going to host a place and host a tournament to pay homage to those who are there and the history that goes there, mm. it doesn't have to be... I'm not trying to be a feminist killjoy, but... Or am I, though? Um, <laughs> am I? Um, or... Or is it like, what are we doing here? Are the stories being told? I'm a storyteller by, by trade and hearing the stories of elders as opposed to only, and maybe this is a reminder to myself in the media industry that in addition to the importance of Sam's calf, we need to talk about 
the stories from those communities as well. Mm -hmm. So that's just, and I, again, I'm noting that I'm a settler in my land, which is Anishinaabeg land in uh, Toronto, and I'm a settler as well of immigrant experience. So it is quite layered, but that's the importance of telling those stories mm -hmm. and understanding all those intersections and how they land. And you know, I think media plays a really important part in that. And to a large degree, sometimes I think that media fails. I, I did hear Football Australia's First Nations um, general manager speaking yesterday at a symposium. Um, I think her name is Courtney. Somebody who can yeah, nod. Mm. She actually, uh, I thought, summed it up really well. She said, "Football, our oh, sport by nature is um, is inclusive in nature, but exclusive by culture." And I did, mm -hmm. th and she meant culture generally, not as in First Nations culture. But I thought that was a really good mm. way of summing it up. But I think you've just nailed that. It's um, yeah, you. In, at its base, we should all be able to play, but yeah, when you see it play out in, in World Cups, not so much. So, Asmina, I think you were going to add to that. Yeah, um, yeah no, I mean, I, I completely agree with everything Shireen was saying, and um, I think uh, we've made some great advancements in terms of having the Indigenous flag and Torres Strait Islander flags represented, and I know that in itself was a bit of a fight itself to have those at, at all, all the games. Um, I think that's terrific, but certainly we've got a long way to go in terms of so many ranging issues from um, what Julie mentioned about facilities to infrastructure to removing barriers for girls to be able to just participate in the sport, um, but as well as that, ensuring that the game um, uh, is accessible to everyone. Um, and there's, there's a bunch of us ambassadors. I'm, of course, from a culturally diverse background. I also sit on the board at Football Victoria, um, and when I first ran for the board, they were like, that, that, that girl, she's, she's the one running for the board uh, because Rude. I'm not European and I'm not a bloke. Um, I don't fit the narrative of what it means mm. to, to be part of football, essentially. Um, and uh, and I, I, I query whether it's the same sort of issue in, in Canada as well, but um, ensuring that women from all different backgrounds, religions, faiths, um, disability, sexual orientation are, are represented in the game. Um, and have opportunities to participate just like anyone else. Mm -hmm. I can assure you that I'm not the standard sports journalist from Canada. I <laughs> guarantee you. Uh, Aren't you the interpreter? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, people are quite shocked in the fact that the organization that I work for, the Canadian Broadcasting Company, trusted me with this massive assignment to go. Mm. It's really wild to some people that Canadians are getting their coverage, part of their coverage from a, you know, a Muslim brown woman in a hijab. And there's a lot of people that aren't very happy about that, but that's not a me problem. That's mm -hmm. a them problem. So like mm -hmm. you, we're very similar that way. But even within the women's football space, opening up to other women within those margins is also something that we need to keep doing. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I think it speaks to female visibility as well. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we, we've had uh, very little female visibility over the years, and it's only now that we're starting to see uh, women in, in spaces that w they would never occupied before. So um, yeah, when I was growing up, uh, the question I'm asked is, OK, which female player did you admire? And my answer is, I never saw any female players. Mm -hmm. So I admired Glenn Hoddle because he was from the EPL and that's what we saw on TV. So I think um, social media's had a big role to play in changing attitudes so that, uh, you know, because the media influences opinions and, and attitudes. And so what we see is what we start to think is the norm. So, but now, thankfully, we're starting to see a big change with that. So attitudes and uh, opinions are changing. I wanted to pick up on that, actually, because so we talk about you've got to see it to be it. Um, and obviously, Sam Kerr, we know that that succeeded in that space. There's many girls um, dreaming of becoming Sam Kerr. But I actually wonder if there's actually um, girls and women who are dreaming of becoming like you. I mean, you are leading the space in uh, at a board level, at an at a ambassador level, at a media level, at a player and also player advocacy level. I'm wondering if you've had any kind of feedback or response in the lead up to the tournament or in the last couple of weeks about people who've been actually inspired by the work mm -hmm. that you're doing. I think Emma's sitting here, you know, she's going to get away with answering nothing. Yeah, soon. no, no, she's going to... No, I actually was making eye contact with Emma then because like, you've got both a PFA hat on and a player hat on, so you're seeing the two and you're bringing them along together. Yeah, it's been um, a pretty different position to be in. Um, obviously, I've been represented by the PFA and for those of you who don't know, they're our players' union. Um, so 
as a player, I've always felt like I understand just how much work goes into representing us and challenging the CBA and negotiating for better standards. And it wasn't until I became employed by them that I actually saw the work that goes in. And I think it's, I felt like I was a pretty grateful player and I, but I most certainly wasn't relative to the work that goes on. And the work that goes on to achieve the standards we had, have, sorry, yes, it's the players and the performances, but the people behind the scenes, mm. there's so much um, tireless work and yeah. hours that doesn't get credit for for the players to be in the position that they are. And so it's a weird place for me to have a player hat and now also have that hat. But I think I feel like my role is now to explain and, and spread the word of what work does go on because... I feel like it's easy to just think that it's going to happen and expect that it'll mm. happen, but it doesn't. Mm. It takes people in the right roles mm. with the right attitude and desire to actually get it done. So for me, it's uh, I feel like I'm much more appreciative and grateful of where we've come. And I now feel like it's my responsibility to make sure that everyone has that attitude and outlook because unless we're tied in together, we, we're not going to continue with that growth. Yeah, and uh, if I remember back to my days, it was uh, like these uh, people aren't doing anything for us. We'd go away on, on tour and um, we'd be given a, a, a uniform to play in. And your number was, you know, dependent on what size fit you. <laughs> so because we found out later that some of our playing strips were borrowed from the under-15 boys, the, the national team boys. And not only that... Um, we had to hand them back mm -hmm. at the end of the tournament. And we thought, Jesus, you know, um, we how many lamingtons have I sold to get here? <laughs> and now I have to give my strip back. Um, so we thought a lot of times that the administrators you know, supporting us weren't doing enough, but they were fighting tooth and nail just to get that. And so many other things. So... Mm -hmm. Um, I, I fully concur with what Emma has just said, you know, about these unsung heroes in the background. You know, no numbers on the back of their shirts and they're, they're kicking the big goals that get those players on the park, mm -hmm. uh, that excite the crowds, that bring in the revenue and what keeps the game going. Mm. As Mina and Shireen, I wonder if... Um, I don't even know... You both mentioned that you are from culturally and linguistically diverse communities. I'm wondering if there are girls and women who you're saying you're not a traditional sports journalist is that actually inspiring a whole generation and, and a, uh, that the game hasn't been open to to date well I think in addition to like the sports media aspect I mean my industry in North America and sports in particular that vector is 95% white able-bodied cishet men mm -hmm. I'm not a white man surprise so um, it's very different for me. But yes, I get calls from racialized young women, people from marginalized community, disabled students, uh, racialized students from very different. And it's just the point is that you're not the same, that you're different. So there's a sort of solidarity that they see or they're rooting for you. You know what I mean? And yeah, I, do I like to think I want to inspire? Media is not the most stable industry. And I'm, my dad was like, why are you telling people to go into media? Tell them to be doctors and lawyers and teachers. <laughs> So, yeah. which I did not do, right? So it's, it is, I'm grateful to say that people have responded really well. I mean, it's still, but the other thing too, it's not just in this role, advocating for other people and not just women, but a, a huge emphasis mm -hmm. on racialized communities as well mm -hmm. and marginalized communities in particular to be in roles within football like Ismina, to be board positions, to be owners, to be medical staff, mm -hmm. to be trainers, to be nutritionists, to be business uh, to be able to be agents, to guide athletes for contracts. There's so many roles. It's not just the pitch anymore. And to encourage people to do any of those things, mm. to be officials, to be referees, is huge. Yeah. Um, there's uh, the first Palestinian ref at, at any World Cup is here. Mm. These are not small steps. Mm. These are huge things. And part of the story is that we hear and the successes that we hear. But there's still so much. We're just getting going. I'm getting so excited. <laughs> I'm going to go back to my students and say, please be on boards. Mm. Be on boards. That's where the decision The fact that you're doing this is massive. It's something that Canada doesn't have at the moment. The players are the leadership team negotiating. How are they supposed to focus on football when there's the, mm. they have to? Mm. So essentially, we talked about this. You know, 
Um, I, you know, Lindsay, my colleague, is a reporter for senior reporter for CBC. Every presser, we ask them, "What about the CBA?" We're focused on the football, which is what they actually should be doing. So the fact that Emma's role exists is so important because mm -hmm. it gives the players opportunity to actually do their job. So there's, I know I went over here with your question. That's I just okay. got excited. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. That's what media is so important. I yeah. mean, I, I think it's probably the one area where we're really underrepresented in terms of women mm. and diverse women as well from all different walks of life. So um, we need more of you and tell your dad, you, to, you know, you don't need to go down the path of doctors <laughs> and lawyers. <laughs> got too many of those, at least here in Australia. Yeah. Um, but, but um, yeah, from, from my perspective, um, from a board um, governance perspective, I think there's, there are a lot of um, emerging um, leaders. There's a lot of women coming into this space, uh, and I think it's something that will continue to grow, and we just continue, we need to continue to, um, to support it. Um, the difference, though, with football, of course, is from, if you look at it from specific to your question, around a multicultural lens, um, it, we're already miles and miles ahead. We're, we're a global game, um, and that, that's where my passion stems from, the fact that it, it doesn't matter where you're from or what your background is, is everyone plays football. Um, and uh, as was mentioned in a past life, um, I was previously approached by AFL, uh, and they approached me and said, hey, we understand that there's a risk to a reduction in our following and our membership by reason of us not being up to speed with reflecting the community and reflecting uh, the society that we're made up of. Yeah, um, if, if our national code, you know, is feeling vulnerable around not being representative of the ordinary Australian walking down Little Lonsdale Street, um, it, 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 it speaks volumes. Um, and so they um, asked myself and a couple of others to be involved in uh, ensuring that multicultural communities are represented in, in football, in AFL. Um, we certainly don't have that as a problem in football. It's a global game um, and uh, we're, we're much more progressive and, and miles ahead. Um, but if we're talking about who inspires or um, sort of our reflections on um, who has been inspired most within the game, um, from my perspective, um, what I've really enjoyed seeing is um, all the little boys, yeah. all the young boys um, who've come along to games uh, and have cheered on the Matildas um, and have just completely parked that label of gender. It hasn't mm -hmm. mattered. Um, and, and the future for, for sport um, is essentially that it doesn't matter what, what gender you are. Your hero can be a female. Um, and I think that's huge. It's, it's something that we're, we're still getting used to. Um, and it's terrific. I'm conscious we probably only have a few minutes left, but I do really want to ask, uh, you're in the room now with male administrators uh, and you're advocating in different ways or you're working with um, male media who've come to the tournament who perhaps don't always um, pay attention to women's football. What advice would you like to impart to those male administrators um, for moving forward beyond this tournament about, OK, maybe you weren't on board with women's football or you didn't realise just how extraordinary it was prior to this, but what would you like to see them enact going forward and, and also including you in the space? Um, I'll just jump into this because I love this question and it's, <laughs> I just love this question. I'm um, at the first ESPNW summit in Canada. I was fortunate to be there. And my colleague, Marsha Gay Knight, is uh, she runs a uh, black and sport business. And she said something in her presentation. She said, look in the room and see who's not there. Take note of who is not in the room. And then there's your task list. Mm -hmm. Who is not represented? Which communities do you not see? Whose voices are not amplified? Um, and that's something that has stayed with me and will probably, you know, sort of motivate the work that I do in my own personal practice. Who is not there is very important because as we make strides, it's important to extend that to other people. And truly, um, our liberations are tied. I don't need to say that here. <laughs> that statement comes from here. But I think that's something that I really find heartening is... Mm. And, and positive in a good way, that you now have some kind of power, or perhaps you're from a demographic that always did. So do better. 
Um, <coughs> oh, I'll, I'll jump in next because it's basically an extension of what Shireen's had to say. Um, I, I think it's so important. Firstly, we're always going to have people like that. Uh, my personal experience is, is I don't have time for those sort of people. I'd rather just work with those that are um, on board and progressive and, and, um, and getters. They'll catch up one day. But um, essentially, I think it's so important that we do um, capture those on the fringes uh, and make sure that their voice is heard and that they're given a platform to be heard. Um, and as well as that, I'm a big believer in ensuring that uh, we never forget the journey that we've been on and hearing from people like Julie and, and others um, about that journey that we've been on and ensuring that we never forget that and never take it for granted um, and um, continue to, to sort of live on that legacy, the legacy that you've started. Yeah, and I, for me, uh, it's also about recognising the male champions. Um, and as, as Mina was saying, uh, there are many and uh, it's important to work with them. And it's not about criticising this person or that person. It's like getting on board with the people that do support us. And, and there are plenty of males. And uh, so it's a, a good space to work in. Yeah, I think just one last thing, like from a player lens, I think we all have a role to play in the education of these men as well. Like I feel like it's really, we're now in a different place in sport where female players are speaking up, they are sharing their stories. And I think that creates a shift as well because they're they're willing to call people out whereas historically I don't think that was happening so now we're in a place where female athletes aren't accepting of of those characters within those spaces so I think I think that's also a big leap in the right direction okay if I could just give one more example I flew into town last night and um, as I was walking to the um, hotel uh, I saw a, a women's football game on in the pub right so I thought oh, I'll just pop in for a quick lemonade, <laughs> <laughs> as you do. And uh, so I sat down. I was watching the the China China Haiti game, and behind me I heard this bloke say, "Oh Jesus, what's going on on that TV?" Mm -hmm. And I was just about to throw my beer up. You sorry, mean your lemonade? My um, <laughs> lemonade. <laughs> Did I say beer out loud? Yeah. <laughs> um, all over in that voice. You know, yeah. there, there you have it. Uh, but it's one you know, in a million these days, as opposed to one in many, which is really heartening. OK, I have two last questions, and then I think we'll, we will need to wrap it up. Uh, we could keep talking all day, I'm sure. But uh, I'm going to play devil's advocate. It's the world game, but obviously right now much of our focus is on Australia and um, Sam Kerr's calf. If Australia bows out, what interesting teams, stories, opportunities, triumphs will that free us up to focus on? Like, what else should we know about? This might be a Canadian lens, I don't know. <laughs> but we'll still be friends after this. But yeah. I don't know, Monday night, ooh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, one of the undercurrent stories uh, has, has been injuries. Mm. And that has unfortunately also united players in a way. I mean, the Lionesses were essentially, part of their attacking line was decimated from mm. ACL injuries. And I mean, moving- about Kira Walsh last night oh, as well. Oh, Kira Walsh yeah. last night, yeah. I didn't get a report on what actually, if it was ACL or meniscus, or I don't know. Hopefully, it's not. It's I don't. not looking positive. No, yeah. it, it looked like ACL. <laughs> and everything that, every time yeah. I tweeted this out, every time someone falls to the pitch, I'm like, oh my goodness, mm -hmm. and I do a silent prayer for everyone's ligaments before the match mm -hmm. starts. <laughs> Just, you know, you, you hope. But um, that's not a positive storyline, but I think something that I have found really exciting is are the new teams and the strides they've made. And even if a Vietnam's legacy is only to black Alex Morgan's penalty, we'll take it. <laughs> OK? Uh, Morocco's, you know, Nohela Benzina is the first woman in a hijab on a pitch at a World Cup, we'll yeah. take it. Yeah. Um, we'll take, you know, Philippines winning their match. Mm. We'll take that joy. Katie McCabe scoring this incredible Olympico. Like, oh my mm. goodness. Like, there's moments of glory and happiness that we do actually. Because this work, although we look so, you know, fabulous all the time. It's exhausting. I was joking. Um, I'm, in, I'm absolutely knackered. So um, it's, it, for me personally, joy is a tool of resistance. Yeah. It is a tool that I use personally, in addition to coffee, to keep going. And we need those stories. So where you find joy on the pitch, where you relate to a player, where you see a play, if it's a little boy wearing a jersey, if it's you know someone mimicking Russell's little bows in their hair, 
take it and embrace it. And, you know, uh, the uh, discourse around the Americans is always, I think it always overwhelms me. So I try to minimize, no offense to any Americans out there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, just having conversations more deeply and being aware. And so it's not a technical question about the strength of teams. It's about the culture and to insert yourself into it and to contribute to it. So whatever we see, the, the knockout, the group of 16 going forward, just be so grateful that it's here and see how much football is for everyone truly and how we can all put ourselves in there and, and, and keep the ball. I'm so excited. Keep the ball rolling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well said. I don't know if anyone wants to follow that. That's hard, hard to talk. No, yeah. I think we should throw to questions. You throw to questions? <laughs> All right. I have one last question, but then, yeah, we're going straight into questions, I promise. So if anyone's got a burning question in the audience. But, Julie, this is actually, um, I, when I interviewed you for my latest book, I, you, I said to you, did, were you aware in 1988 that you were making history? And you said to me, and I quote, no, not really. You have a sense of how important it is, but when that momentum isn't behind you, you sometimes wonder whether it's going to get any legs. You know, whether the Pilot World Cup will turn into anything else or whether we'll go back and just keep trying to build. I didn't really have a sense of what would happen in the future, probably because of the lack of momentum behind women's football back home. Everyone just tried so, so hard all the time, and that hasn't changed. People are still trying very, very hard to make the most of it. So my question to everybody is... What, we've got the momentum now. I think we've also got the money coming in and the the um, the attitudinal shift as well. What are we going to do to keep the momentum moving? Can I just say, firstly, she just sighed when you were like, I'm going to quote her. She's yeah. Like, what did I say? I want to know your thoughts. On, on yeah. what, what, <laughs> Maybe Julie should open my open thoughts. <laughs> my thoughts were, as they always are, geez, I hope I sounded intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> you did. You did. Um, no, um, Emma's still not doing very much. Yeah, well, I was going to say, yeah. Yeah. Emma's next, yeah. <laughs> um, I think for me, like, the biggest thing with that is we all need... We all have a role to play. I don't think we can rely on the players. Like, I think we need to, as a, a broader collective, realise that we all, we all have to chip in and the results and the, you know, the players themselves can't achieve the flow-on effect alone. Um, it's up to the federations and everyone involved, whether you're officially involved or not, or as a fan, that we all do our part because for this to have the reach that it's capable of, that that's the only way we're going to get there. We can't sit back and wait for the players to do it themselves. Um, they're doing their part by being on the field and I think now it's up to all of us and everyone globally to tap in and, and contribute. Mm. Brilliant. Shireen, we've made eye contact. Yep, you got anything to add to that? No, that was brilliant. Mm. Yep. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we've got three minutes left. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if anybody has a burning question, please put your hand up yep, and we'll bring a mic to you. Hi. Um, I'm wondering what advice... Uh, sorry, I should say, bearing in mind that NRLW has just started, so in Australia we've got more football codes where there are women playing professionally even if they're not paid like that yet you your uh, football soccer to be clear within Australia is obviously much further ahead with with um, I suppose more inclusivity whereas if you look at the screen for NRLW or AFLW it's mm. much less diverse is there advice that you would give potential not the top level administrators but kind of at a grassroots level of how they can build the diversity at you know coming the whole way down the participation chain in Australia? Mm. Um, great question. And I think it's, um, it is so important that all ends of the spectrum are covered. So in, in my experience, I've found that in order to create change, we, we need to start at that leadership level um, and to then sort of infiltrate through the organisation and, and work downwards. Um, <clears throat> I think we need to really get to the, the crux of what are the barriers to participation in that um, and how do we remove those barriers to participation and ensure that we open um, doors and open opportunities for women to participate. Um, I, I don't like the argument when people say, oh, no, there, we, we don't have any talent from... X, Y, and Z backgrounds, that's the reason. Um, I, I beg to differ. Uh, I think um, so many girls 
from all different walks of life want to participate in the game and, and the, the onus is on us to, to um, address those issues. And, I mean, they're, 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 there's so many, whether it's disability or um, by reason of their sexual orientation or religious needs or, you know, just, just last week we've had our first woman being able to play football wearing a hijab. It just sounds ridiculous. It's 2023 and it's taken us this long mm-hmm. um, to get there. Uh, that's just one example, but it's it's a serious issue and um, certainly starts at the leadership level and, and it's something we need to address. What's resonating with me, though, is what Shireen was saying as well. Uh, look around and, and think, who's not here? Mm. And there's your to-do list. I wonder, Emma, if you, from a PFA perspective as well, you're looking at advocate, advocating, I don't know, for trans players or for, yeah, for that greater diversity. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting space. We actually had um, someone come in for an education session on trans athletes and, and the shift in that area. And I think um, the new laws have actually really helped in that space. And now, unless you, you can't discriminate, unless there is um, what's deemed like a reasonable ground to do so. And I think that's just a baseline. But obviously, I, I feel like education is key. And it's it's hard because we're all, you know, we're all brought up from different different ways of life, different views and different lenses. And unless, and unless you are educated, sometimes it is hard to understand. But I think the best thing we got told was that you don't always have to understand to include. And I think that was what, like, sunk in with me was you don't, you don't have to get it, you don't have to know why, but you just have to respect it and, and learn to adjust and adapt because there's no wrong or right way sometimes. And I think that was what stuck with me was understanding and acceptance can be separated. I need to write that down. Yeah, me too. <laughs> wow, that summed it up well. I'm conscious it's three o'clock. I'm looking around at the Wheeler Centre team. Do we have time for one more question? One more? <laughs> yep, let's do it. Okay. Anybody keen? Uh, I'll let the Wheeler Centre staff. I don't want to be the bad cop, so <laughs> I'll let you choose. Hello. Um, my question is specifically probably going to head towards Emma. And now that you work for the PFA, I don't know how much you're going to be able to say, but <laughs> maybe a little bit more than when you were just playing for Melbourne City. Um, with the A-League women's game, what is the pathway you see to having that being seen as more equal in terms of how do we keep these amazing players that we have playing for the Matildas, how do we keep them at home? Like, you know, we all know why they go to the WSL. Again, understand why you yourself went internationally as well. And we can see that, yeah, there are things like we've extended the season, things like that, but we still have players who have to have a job, Mm. like to be able to fund themselves. And you can even watch the Matilda's documentary of Courtney Vine, (laughs) you know what I mean? Like before she had these endorsements and things like that. So my question is, what pathway do you see, the steps that need to be taken for the A-League women to start to be more professional? Yeah, it's... To be honest, I think we have this conversation at work every single day at the moment. Um, And the first step was lengthening the season. Um, And and that has been a key focus for a long time now because initially it wasn't just financial reasons that players were leaving. It was also the fact that it was 10 games. So I think nailing that was was a key part of the process. Um, And... With that, um, even now, we're still fighting for higher minimum wages and Mm -hmm. the salary cap is going to extend. um, The minimum spend for each club is going to extend. So I think there's a lot more happening than what it may seem. And they are, you know, ideally the steps are bigger and quicker. But I think now that I am seeing the flip side of it and at an administration level, how much is actually changing, I I feel like we are progressing. Um, And I, I would like that it would be sooner but there are a lot of steps in place and the current CBA for the league is positive and it gets it gets re-addressed uh, at the end of every season um, and so the minimum standards now will never go backwards and I think when you look at our league and you compare it to England for example and America the minimum wage for a player here if you were to average it out per week or per month is actually comparing quite well the biggest difference we have at a financial level is is still the length of the season because mm-hmm. 
you sign now for six or seven months, whereas you can go and play overseas and sign for a year. So it's not necessarily when you go to those countries, you're, you're not signing just for a season, you're signing for a year. Mm -hmm. So I think that is still a, a big difference. And I think until we can close that gap, it's going to be really hard to draw players back. Mm -hmm. All right, so something to work on beyond the World Cup, that's mm -hmm. for sure, yeah. That might be a good place to leave it. Could I ask everyone to put their hands together to thank Shireen, Anna, Julie and Azmina.